everybody so welcome to another edition of knowledge graph technology showcase winter edition where i go through some of the cool tools and services that are out there so that you don't necessarily have to reach out to that salesperson unless you really want to all right and these are all my honest review these are not sponsored and if I missed something that you really want to see reviewed, make sure you link it down below. And today we are going to be talking to Cambridge Semantics, one of the Forrester Wave top graph databases out there. And this is really challenging some of the other key players that are in the market today. This is a great tool, especially for those that are trying to develop knowledge graph solutions that analysts and people that are not necessarily graph people that need to interact with the data and be able to spin things up very quickly. This is a great tool for that. And I was really surprised to see that they also have some tagging expertise if you really need some help with that. So if this sounds interesting to you and you want to check out one of the top graph databases that are out there, make sure you stick around. Everyone, my name is Boris Shalomov. I'm a senior field engineer at Cambridge Semantics. I'm Ben Seckley. Chief Revenue Officer and one of the co-founders of Cambridge Semantics. So Ashley, we, we've always, um, since we started early in the days of IBM and, and going into the, the founding of, of Cambridge Semantics, really been all about bringing the, the promise of, of semantic technology and knowledge graphs to the enterprise. Um, mm -hmm. And there are two, two really big aspects of that. One is making it easy to use. So, you know, mm -hmm. where do I get started if I'm a you know, non-technical user who doesn't know Sparkle, how do I get my knowledge graph going quickly, right? How do I go from all my sources and quickly construct a fabric, you know, in a really fast, agile way that can leverage a lot of the existing skill sets and knowledge within my organization? And so our, our overall platform, Anzo, uh, has a lot of tooling that Boris will show you today that makes it really easy to do that, starting from building the knowledge graph itself to maybe more importantly, how do people consume it, right? Through, mm -hmm. through dashboards, mm -hmm. their tool of choice, or their data science notebook, really bringing the knowledge graphs more mainstream. And so our underlying uh, database, Anzo Graph, is a really cool, massively parallel, cloud-ready, uh, mm -hmm. primarily in-memory uh, beast that enables you to go from, whether it's starting small with tens of millions of triples, all the way to tens to even trillions of triples. So get your users going quickly, and when they do, have the horsepower needed to get them going fast and far. Yeah, and I absolutely love that messaging because after doing so many of these and just working in the industry for so long, I feel like a lot of people are left out in the cold <laughs> because they maybe didn't have a computer science background or you know they are uh, given a role at their at their company and they're like, what's a graph? I don't know what this is. And so having a tool to help those folks is important. But I think it's time to see what you have going on under the hood. So um, yeah, what, what you're seeing here is basically the front page of Enzo. And like what one of the things that I, I'd like to emphasize and why like what the product is trying to support is basically when you're building an enterprise knowledge graph that is you know, that is trying to support collective intelligence within a company, as you guys said, it's very important to include all the domain experts who have all the knowledge that is supposed to be turned into a graph at some point um, and to include them into the process of building out the ontologies and modeling the data and consuming the data and, um, and basically follow being able to follow every step of the process without being an expert in RDF or Spark or whatever. And I'm going to hop through many different features here just to, to give you a feeling of how the tool supports this whole process. But I think like one thing that's that's just important to mention is that the target of the tool is basically to to include domain experts uh, into the process and not just leave it up to let's say um, the IT department, which is uh, I think crucial for knowledge graphs. One thing that people really struggle with after that whole first buy-in process is now I have to have to, I have to get a team, I have to get engineers, I have you know this giant orchestration that has to happen having something that is so easy to understand that's not necessarily you have to be a graph engineer right out of the gate is going to help ease that that pain of of starting into graph yeah exactly i mean every company has people who who have more knowledge than some some of the databases right and you oh, yeah to be able to to formalize some of their knowledge to to connect the data into a graph. So basically, when, when you work with Enzo, you, you will usually be guided through the four phases of building a knowledge graph, where the, the ones that you can see here, which is basically phase of onboarding your data. So you basically prepare these structured and unstructured sources that you want to integrate into your knowledge graph. 
Mm -hmm. um, then you basically that the second stage is the modeling stage where you're trying to create the target canonical model that represents your business logic and the business logic of the company, the processes and the way that people think and the databases uh, work. And the blending phase is basically combining the two things where you basically all the data from the data sources that you disintegrated, where you're mapping the data to the um, to the target ontologies. Um, this is a process that partly has to be done manually, partly can be done, uh, partly can be automated. And once we once we had that step, this step is actually, um, let's say, the biggest part of building out the knowledge graph, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but, but once you're done with that, you have a few features that help you accessing the data and consuming the data. And you also have ANZO and ANZO unstructured component where you're able to um, load up unstructured text and uh, tag it and combine it with ontologies. Very cool. Uh, when you said that you can take the unstructured data and tag it, is this sort of like what like pool party allows you to do where it's like semantic indexing, machine learning stuff? Basically, we run what are called annotators on the mm -hmm. text, and we have our own built-in net where you can bring in like a SCOS vocabulary or your own RDF from your graph and use it as a taxonomy with patterns and synonyms. And then we mm -hmm. find all the instances of those in the text. We usually build out an RDF model of the documents. So we have document annotations, mm -hmm. and you can connect to things like Amazon Comprehend or other different kinds oh, of like, nice. services. And it all gets normalized into an RDF graph for that document. Mm -hmm. And we take the text and put that into Elasticsearch. And we have Elasticsearch integrated with our graph engine. So you can kind of do this really powerful Sparkle based exploration of all of your index documents. And so you Very can layer cool. in machine learning on top of that if you wanted to use that as your NLP capability. That's awesome. Thank you. So the, the, the demo I'm going to show you is in the space of product lifecycle management. So basically integrating data about mechatronic products, which is the case, let's say, for automotive companies, aerospace, uh, mechanical engineering, and so on. So one thing that ties together all these steps where we kind of, that allows us to follow through the process and blend all the data um, are so-called graph marts. So if we go to this PLM graph mart that we created here, you'll see that we have here a small data set that is basically consists of four stores tables um, and a target ontology that has four concepts related to each other. Um, the numbers you can see here are basically the instances instances that you have for each of the concepts. Um, the part that you see on the right side is basically, so in the middle you see your, um, your auto-generated schemas. And on the right side, there's some data profiling that just how gives you indications before you start actually modeling or mapping just giving you a feeling for the data that you will, will be working with. So like about different attribute counts and about, like, let's say, uh, the variance of data and so on. A snapshot, a very quick snapshot of probably a very, very large data set. Exactly. So we're, we're, we obviously like Anzo has an ontology editor and so on integrated, but like what you're doing when you actually want to map the sources to your target ontology model this is where um, you go to the graph marts and you're able to create different layers with completely different types of steps um, that would allow you to merge and blend this data. Um, the simplest steps are transformation steps. So we can, if we go here, we can see that here are some steps that are basically, some of them are loading data, some of them are virtualizing data from other sources. Um, Basically, these layers are putting all the transformations that you refine in a chronological order. So if you go here and look at which kinds of steps you have, you can see that you can load data, you can pre-compile different queries, you can create query templates, you can automatically create inferencing steps and data validation steps and create templates for users. Yeah, in fact, the graph mart, the, the construct of it has a lot of the data mesh principles mm -hmm. in mind, which is that you know, the data mesh is not okay. I'm, when I when a, when an organization goes to build a data mesh, it's not about right picking one product and doing everything within the ecosystem of that product, right? It's about productizing data in the way that makes the most sense for different parts of the organization. And so, a graph mart allows an organization, a part of an organization that has decided that knowledge graph, right, is the way that they want to participate in the data mesh because it helps them to integrate the data and virtualize it. But these layers that Boris is showing, they can they can connect to different other data products over APIs and blend them yeah. into the knowledge graph. And they can expose this not the knowledge graph created data product 
as an API, non-Sparkle API, like a REST API that other data products can consume. Absolutely. I mean, so what I showed you, like some of the steps, for example, are queries. So you can, for example, if you want to calculate the page rank of specific parts in the product structure, right, to show how important the part is for the product structure and how impactful it changed to this part be um, in the product structure, you can define all that within a Sparkle query if you want to use Sparkle for that, right? So there are built-in algorithms to answer graphs that you can just reuse. You set a few parameters, you say which relationship you're interested in, and you can calculate that. But obviously in, in this whole mapping and calculation processes, not everyone will always want to use Sparkle to define everything. So there are also features built in, like for example, the find connections features, where you can say, okay, I'm interested in looking at the data sources and comparing the instances uh, with a fuzzy match with, let's say, an overlap of at least 95%, or let's say, let's be a bit less strict on this, let's say 68% or whatever. And then you basically will be able to, um, to find the connections automatically. So it will create... Oh, where are those connections coming from? So the fuzzy matching is matching what you have in your data to to what? So it, it's looking at the data sources and it's comparing the columns of the data sources and saying, okay, this column, let's say suppliers that has a slightly different syntax. Um, mm, okay. One source, it can be related to another source or it can be a combination in a different source. So it's basically mainly using um, uh, syntactic similarity to find out which, which things are there. Okay, and, cool. Um, but it's yeah. also using the data, right? It's doing a substantial amount of data profiling and analysis of the overlapping values themselves. So even if you had headers that don't align, which is often the problem, right? When you're when you're linking sources together, it's going to look at the data to try to find some similarities and overlaps. Great. Exactly. And is there an export so you can actually see and and manipulate and and update, and make decisions from that? Yeah, sure. So there there is actually like if you look at one of the steps, you can see that these would automatically generate the queries for you. So you will see what the what the algorithm actually found and it's saying, okay, oh, this source, a column in this source would actually match to one of the others. So like one, one other thing or what, maybe the last thing that uh, I'd like to show is data consumption. So every graph mart has um, basically a way of creating dashboards based on the data that has been transformed and imported into it. And maybe the, the most interesting thing about the dashboards are that, that they are all dynamic and they're all basically querying the graph in real time so whenever you let's say set a filter um, it will be queried in real time so what you see here from the data we integrated it's a supplier criticality dashboard where you look at all your suppliers right in the product life cycle management context at all parts that the suppliers supply and all the product variants that use the parts and based on that, you calculate, okay, how many parts does each of the suppliers supply, how many different parts, and how many different product variants are all these parts used. So you can basically trace back the um, consequences of, let's say, a contract uh, going wrong or something with a supplier um, on your whole organization and all the products. I've actually used this uh, technique before when I worked in that industry. There was a computer chip where a supplier of a supplier of a supplier uh, was tracked through knowledge graph connections. And we, it was basically the, the main reason we found that there was uh, a bug that was put into that, that chip that was then put into very big vehicles that if they had malfunctioned, it would have been very bad. This is, this is a very good use case. And I know you're just going through the probably safe, happy, <laughs> happy way you would use graph here but you can also use it to find threats and, and other exactly. risks that are in, in your information. Yeah, especially if you mentioned just like the supply chain network, so not only the consequence within the company, but also just bottlenecks and supply chains. And obviously, like one of the most interesting use cases is like for, for a company to know like what will happen to my supply chain? Will there be bottlenecks? Will I be able to, to receive the part and build my cars or whatever in the future? And sometimes, original equipment manufacturers don't know who the second tier or third tier suppliers are right so so yeah and basically creating all these all these views th this is something that can be done by any user without knowing sparkle because for example if you go to this bubble chart here and you look at the designer you see that it's just traversing through the knowledge graph right so we're going through supplies and has a part and then we do a count distinct whereas the count distinct is just one of the functions that you can pick you can also do more advanced things but let's say 
I think 90% of the things that you're going to be or the things that you're going to be using 90% of the time, they're all on the uh, in the UI. You can always like go back and do more complicated dashboards, right? So if you want to like explore your graphs and visual views, and um, if you want to do like graph algorithms, and if you want to write Sparkle queries that will give you results, you can always do that. Um, but but it's let's say in most cases you can do all the graph um, dashboards without actually. So actually you have here, if you look at the left top, you have all the different lenses that you can use. And you have here, you basically just import like a table, chart, uh, query lens, and network navigator lens, which you see here in the background, right? So there's many different features that you can just use that will provide you templates. And then but you specify the data you want to see in them by just traversing through your ontology and saying, I'm interested in this class and how it's connected. Then you traverse and go to the next class, right? Well, this is really the tool that kind of brings together the differentiators that we kind of kicked off with. Mm -hmm. where you can see a sort of a non-technical user certainly can use a dashboard, but a non-technical user can also build one, right? It's generating mm -hmm. all the Sparkle queries behind the scenes. And even if you have a knowledge graph of say 20 billion triples, right? Sitting in your in the graph engine, the user can still create these ad hoc queries with analytics, with rollups, with filtering, and it dynamically queries that graph without any caching required to provide an interactive experience. And that's something that we're pretty confident is unique to Cambridge Semantics. Yeah, and I love that too because of, of the first thing that I said was buy-in. Yeah, exactly. Very good point, actually. So uh, I think like what, one of the most interesting things, at least like to me when working with graphs, is like being able to use the graph algorithms out of the box, um, like things like clustering, things like um, you know finding yeah either finding clusters or between its centralities and shortest paths and all that all the things that you can build in in your Sparkle queries to, you know, have a more, let's say, an enhancement of Sparkle itself, because Sparkle itself is just a query language, but obviously you want to sometimes do more complicated stuff in it. Um, but but we have a like a Python library that uh, allows you to work with, with Anzo in a very, very easy way and, let's say, allows you to ex access and extract the data so you can like, use your Jupyter Notebook or whatever. There are some analytics that are better done in the graph mm -hmm. and because of our MPP architecture we're actually uniquely positioned to let people do that at scale so being able to run graph algorithms on you know tens of billions of triples pretty easily yeah. in the cloud right is something that is uniquely possible with our with our graph engine great I love this this is great guys the, there's kind of two offerings we have so one is the underlying graph engine Anzo graph and that's available people can download that on the AWS marketplace or um, as Docker images and you run your laptop and just start playing with a lot of the underlying scalability capabilities you've seen here. If you're interested in trying out the full platform, including some of the kind of the visualization tools, the automated ELT and modeling capabilities, certainly, you know, contact us through the website. We can set something up that way.